Blog Talk Radio. University of 
Minnesota, and a master's in physics from the University of Illinois, Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He's also a board member of the Minnesota Planetarium Society. Kind of an interesting thing there. <laughs> okay, so it's my pleasure to welcome Peter Lethick. Peter? Thanks, Bruce. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here today. Okay, uh, Peter, I have to ask you about this planetarium thing. Uh, some people might take a bit of a space cadet, but uh, actually <laughs> I can understand the same impulses and inquiries uh, that lead you to really delve into customer uh, service uh, would probably make you interested about that sort of thing as well. Well, I've certainly been accused of being a space cadet before, so uh, there, there is an element of truth there. Um, <laughs> okay, good. Well, you know, a lot of companies gather customers, and uh, I see this all the time when I go in and and, and see the on-site uh, situations of call centers. And what, what, the challenge, what challenges do you hear from people in the industry when it comes to actually making these processes work for the call center and for the customer? Well, Bruce, you know, one of the biggest challenges we see is actually taking customer feedback and turning that into specific actions that you can take to improve the customer experience. There's a lot of companies that spend a lot of time and money going out and collecting the voice of the customer, but at the end of the day, what they wind up with doesn't seem terribly actionable, doesn't seem like it, uh, it, it, it kind of goes beyond just tracking where you are this month. So the biggest challenge is, taking that raw data, taking the information that you're getting from the customers and turning that into a specific set of actions that you can take to improve the customer experience. Um, it, customers are happy to tell you, if you approach them correctly, how to improve the quality experience, but you have to have the right kind of data. You have to get the customer in the, in the right way in order to get that information from them and then commit to it uh, to, to actually making a difference in your operation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it, well, let's say, Peter, that uh, we have somebody in the audience now who's doing customer survey that they feel isn't really useful. And if there's anyone like that, please do call uh, in and give us a little bit of uh, information on your experience. Uh, do you find that that's usually a problem with the survey itself, or is it a problem with reporting, or is it something else? Well, Bruce, we, we see a lot of different problems, and it could be either of those. It could be uh, some combination of them. I mean, let's face it, there are a lot of bad surveys out there that suffer from uh, significant biases or badly written questions. Um, I've, even, I've even found quite a number where they were literally technically broken in the sense that customers who wanted to take the survey couldn't because, uh, because something wasn't working right. Um, I've also seen a lot of cases where the people within the organization don't have a good sense for why they're actually going out and collecting the feedback, what's supposed to happen with it. Somebody said at some point we ought to be collecting customer feedback, but they didn't really think through the process of what the goals of that project are and what's, what's supposed to be coming out of it. Um, and there are cases where the survey data might be good, and you, that, that's kind of a place that you have to start, but it's just not being delivered in a way that's terribly useful. Um, you know, 15 years ago, it might have been adequate to send a, a, an Excel spreadsheet once a month with, with top-level summary data, but that really doesn't cut it in today's market, and uh, the, the tools and capabilities that are out there are capable of so much more and can really connect the customer feedback that you're getting to uh, to what you can do to improve the service levels. So it's, it's everything at the end of the day. Okay, well, there's a lot of best practices in there. Choose a to have a survey. Hey, Bruce, I'm going to interrupt real quick. Bruce, I'm sorry. Uh, our our connection is uh, being interrupted just a little bit. Could you start over on that last question? Absolutely. Okay. The thing is, if we put ourselves in the shoes of one of the listeners, customer survey perhaps is thinking about launching one, what, what can this 
to make sure that they're really uh, effective and uh, are able to come up with information that's going to drive improvement? Um, so if we're talking about uh, a, a new project or an existing project, there, there's several things to, to look at. Um, and I talk about this in a framework of kind of the three ABLES. You want to have a survey that is reliable, you want to have a survey that is credible, and you want to have a survey that is actionable. Um, reliable is really where you need to start because that is are you collecting data in an unbiased way? Is the, uh, is the survey itself large enough to, to give you meaningful information? Is it scientifically sound? If it's reliable, then you need to ask yourself, is it actionable? Uh, in order to have actionable surveys, you need to have a rich enough data set in order to connect cause with effect. The cause is what you are doing with your customers when they call. What kind of processes are they going through? What kind of agents are they talking through or talking to? What kind of uh, IVR system are they going through? Those are all things that companies can change if they decide to allocate the resources. The effect is how does the customer feel about that experience and what are they going to do about those feelings? Are they going to complain? Are they going to buy again? Are they going to tell their friends uh, either positive or negative things? And if you have a rich enough data set so that you can tie the cause to the effect, then you have data that is actionable. It will tell you specific things that you can do to affect the outcome of, uh, of those customer experiences because you know that a particular customer had particular things happen during the call and that their opinions were certain ways. Um, that means tying the customer opinions to records of what happened in the experience trying to build a detailed questionnaire so that you can ask people about specific things that happened, um, tying it to recordings of the calls. And then making it credible means making sure that everybody actually believes what, uh, what they're telling them. So in other words, is it convincing? Do people have kind of that gut feel that the survey is right or is it wrong? Um, and if you've got those three elements, you have the things in place to, to make a good quality survey process. Um, and then the other thing that I want to talk about is, is the strategic versus the tactical elements. Strategic is being able to kind of track your overall trends. How are things changing month to month, quarter to quarter? Did that new system that we put in place two quarters ago make a difference? And that's very important, but just as important as the tactical feedback, and that is getting the feedback to the people in the front lines quickly and in a way that they can do something about it. Um, the keys there are getting it to the right person, the agent or the supervisor, and getting it to them in a very timely way while they still remember what happened on the interaction or while there's still time, uh, if there's a customer complaint, to, to actually do something positive about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, as you were talking, I was just thinking about the, uh, the three ables, if you will, and uh, for reliable uh, you know, it really does have to be properly crafted, and we do see uh, a large number of questions even that just aren't proper from a scientific point of view. Recently I saw one that uh, said, please rate how the agent uh, was with regard to, in terms of courteousness and helpfulness. Well, really those are two separate things. Courteousness is one thing, and helpfulness is a different thing. So uh, you really are not... You, you need to make sure that each question is scientifically separate and meaningful so that afterwards you really know what it was that the uh, customer was trying to tell you afterwards. And uh, with regard to credible, uh, part of it has to do, too, with, with sample size and what you're going to use it for. Uh, wouldn't you agree, Peter? In other words, if you're going for a, uh, a sample uh, that is basically going to be used for purposes of um, – of uh, coaching, then, you know, it can be a smaller sample. If you're going to actually use it for rating your agents and for deciding who should be uh, promoted or given pay raises, et cetera, then, you know, by the end of the year, you need to have a statistically relevant sample in order to do that, or you're really not being fair to the agent. And uh, we frequently find people who have, uh, or call centers, that are using about 36 or maybe 45 
uh, total uh, of these, you know, uh, responses in order to, to rate an agent over the course of the year. And that simply statistically is not defensible. And, uh, and finally, with regard to the uh, actionable part, I love what you said about getting it right down to the, the agent level uh, because that's where really it can be used to uh, improve performance. So any thoughts on those items? I think, you know, I, I think you're, you're right on, and uh, I'm, I'm glad that you raised the, the topic of coaching too because customer feedback can be a very powerful tool for coaching especially if you combine it with um, the recording of what originally happened. We have, a, we have a client who developed a process. They call it a did you hear session. And they, they will take a recording of a customer interview and put it side by side against a recording of the original customer service experience and ask the agent to find the places in the recording of the customer call that the customer was complaining about in their interview. And it's very powerful because it gets over a lot of the defensive mechanisms that people tend to have when you try to deliver negative feedback. You know, they can hear right. the customer's voice. They can hear that the customer's not out to get them, that, that they're not crazy, that they were talking about the right experience. And yeah. that lends an enormous amount of, of usefulness and credibility to to the whole process. And, right. uh, and you know, credibility is, is really about going beyond the statistics. You know, the, the engineering types, the scientific types like myself, we're satisfied with a good process and a good sample, but not everybody thinks that way. And mm -hmm. being able to get <laughs> that emotional impact is really powerful. Yeah, yeah, and ultimately that emotional impact can have a huge difference on the numbers at the end of the day because if you really have your agents on board with you, if they feel that it's a credible process, that the coaching component is really meant to help them. Uh, and one of the things that I've made for a theme for this year is uh, let's not call people supervisors anymore. Let's call them um, agent uh, advocates, okay? So you're advocating for your agent and trying to make them as best possible, right? And uh, so if they see things in that light, then, uh, then ultimately the numbers are going to change too, right? Absolutely. And, and Bruce, I'll make you a deal. I'll, I'll call the supervisors the advocates if you can call IVR containment self-service. <laughs> 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 Should we make that deal, Brian? What do you think? <laughs> I'm not okay, sure. Okay. <laughs> That's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> we'll think about that. Well, actually, Brian, I think you've got some uh, questions from uh, people listening, so um, over to you for, for a question for Peter. Okay, sounds good. And, uh, and Bruce, just really quick, I just want to mention to all of our listeners that uh, you are in Baltimore and, and uh, doing some business out there, so uh, thanks for uh, joining us there at the last minute. Oh, listen, not at all, not at all. And actually, I uh, went from Baltimore to Washington, D.C., and I think I can even say that I'm uh, in the uh, offices of the IRS right now. They've been very kind to give me some space here, so uh, I'll feel a little better about paying my taxes next year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. Well, uh, well, good. So uh, we do have a couple questions coming in so far to my email. I want to remind everyone out there that uh, we really are trying to promote this as an interactive show. So if you have some questions, and I've been watching the uh, calltalk.tv there. No one's asked quite yet, but uh, feel free to ask uh, a specific question that might pertain to your individual call center and, uh, and uh, take advantage of the expertise here from Peter or Bruce. And also the same thing goes for uh, our callers. I know I have a couple that are listening in from uh, Minnesota, Georgia, actually three or four from Georgia, and also California. So if you have a call or a, or a question, just hit the number one and I'll talk to you offline and we'll get the question straight before we go online. So anyway, first of all, this question comes from John and uh, he asks, we have a customer survey and we're thinking about paying bonuses to agents for good scores, but what should I watch out for? Kind of towards the coaching element of this. Well, that's, that is a great question. You know, uh, paying people bonuses for for good performance is a it is a good and, and standard way to to motivate things to uh, to improve. The thing that you really need to watch out for, and you know these things can get more complicated anytime money is involved, is are you incentivizing the right kind of behavior? 
You want people to actually improve their for performance, not just figure out a way to get their survey scores up. Um, and a lot of this comes back to what Bruce was talking about earlier in terms of making sure the survey process itself is fair and unbiased, and do you have enough responses uh, to, to really tell the difference between your best and your worst performers. Um, something else to, to really keep an eye out for is if there's a bonus or if there's money involved, you want to make sure that you're watching very carefully for people who are finding ways to uh, manipulate the survey process itself by influencing who takes the survey and who doesn't. So um, if the agent has the opportunity or needs to actually put the customer into the survey, you really don't want to use that for compensation because they're not going to put the bad calls into the survey. Um, in fact, we really recommend in this case that you don't do the survey on the same call as the, as the customer experience because there are lots of ways for people to get customers to hang up before they go into the survey. Um, bottom line is that it needs to be thought about very carefully. It can be done, um, but you need to be diligent and, and you need to uh, make sure that you are paying a lot of attention to the process, the biases, that people have an opportunity to appeal it if, uh, if they feel like a survey was unfair, um, but that you're also not just assuming that you're going to throw out surveys um, just because they were negative and that the process is, is completely unbiased. Mm, right. Uh, th these are such important points, so thank you for bringing them to the fore, Peter, and, and uh, making sure that uh, you know the main reason for all of this is to help them improve in performance and actually if in fact uh, you have a situation where money is involved, there are bonuses, and they find that uh, by getting coached and by listening to the coaching, they actually end up making more money for themselves, okay? Then you've got a virtuous circle that gets started, and uh, then that's a, that, that's a thing of beauty really for the call centers because it turns out that the customer gets better service, uh, the company gets better value. And the agent is able to make more money for themselves and feels like they are actually more empowered because they are, in fact, more empowered to make more money for themselves. So uh, really these are uh, uh, things that have to be structured properly, make sure that you have all the right components. Uh, and that's really the subject of a whole other call talk, I think. But uh, uh, really all very interesting and, and important points. So thank you very much for, for that input, Peter. Uh, do we have another question? Brian? Yes, we do, Bruce. <clears throat> this one comes from Kristen, and she writes in, in my company, we have a survey, but it only has a few questions on it, and all we get are monthly scores for the whole call center. This doesn't tell me anything about how to improve, but I'm being held accountable for getting those numbers up. Help. Mm. Good oh, question. gosh. Okay, <laughs> Peter, you can help her, right? Um, you know, Bruce, this is. Thank you for that question, by the way, Christian. A very good question. This is unfortunately a very common situation, you know, and, and in my mind, this is really kind of 1990s style thinking about customer feedback, where you, you go out, you ask just a couple of questions, and you give people their monthly score. And it's fine for kind of tracking performance, but it really isn't all that terribly actionable. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of people out there who are kind of stuck with it. And, uh, and, and they have to make the best of, of what they have. I have a couple of suggestions, and the first one is to see if there's anything that you can do to get faster or more detailed data. Um, so find out who prepares the reports. See if you can get daily or weekly instead of just monthly numbers. See if you can get them the next day instead of, let's say, waiting for, for some period of time after the, after the month closes. Um, and those numbers, are, they're going to be noisy, they're going to be a little harder to interpret, but it's also going to make it easier to see what the connections are. You know, if you had a really busy day and your call center was just slammed and you see that your, your scores went down, um, there's, some, there's some valuable insight in there. Um, if, you see, if you see that you were slammed and your scores didn't go down, that's also a piece of valuable insight because it's telling you that, something you thought might be a connection isn't really a connection. Um, you want to look for 
you know, there's, there's this great term that, that economists and social scientists have, they call it natural experiments, uh, where you can't go out and create an experiment, but you can look at a couple of situations where something might have changed and see if you can determine uh, what the effect of that might be. So look for natural experiments in your call center. For example, um, you know, the, the, the question of having busy days versus slow days, does that seem to have an effect on uh, customer experience uh, satisfaction levels? Uh, new training curricula, changes to your automated customer self-service system. Um, anything that might have changed is an opportunity to compare what happened before and, and what happened after. And it's not going to be perfect, it's not going to be ideal, but at least it will get you some understanding. And, uh, and in the meanwhile, you can lobby to see if you can get more detailed information. Maybe there's, uh, there's the opportunity to get agent-level de agent detail or supervisor-level detail. Um, that might be a longer-term process, but it's well worth doing. Okay, great. Well, uh, great answer there on that as well. And uh, I think we have time for one more question. Um, Brian, do we have another one from a listener? Yeah, we do. Let me see. I've got a couple. Let me uh, scout this here. Uh, okay, this one. But let's solve an argument. Okay, this one comes from Suzanne. She asks, please help me solve an argument we're having about our new customer survey. How long should a survey be? You know, I, I love that question, and um, it's, <laughs> it's right up there with how many surveys should I do as, as kind of most frequently asked questions about how to build a good survey process. Um, the answer, unfortunately, is, is it depends. Um, and there isn't any one answer, but the, the general principle is that you're trying to balance two things here. On the one hand, you're trying to get detailed feedback from a customer about what happened during an experience. It's that detailed feedback um, that helps make the survey actionable. It gives you what you need to go from here's a bunch of data to here are some changes we're going to be making. So you're trying to balance that against really the customer's patience and willingness to help you. You need to keep in mind that a customer who is giving you feedback is doing you a favor. Um, and I think it's very easy to lose sight of that when we get buried in statistics and process. But what you're trying to do is convince the customer to take a little bit of time out of their day to do you a favor. And how big of a favor they're going to do you often depends on whether the customer believes that this is really a, uh, a, a useful and valuable exercise. And one, so, so around that, how you approach the customer for doing the survey is going to make a big difference in how long of a survey you can actually build. If you're doing a live interview, for example, a live interview really communicates the message that we care about this feedback, we're taking time, we're having a real person talk to you, uh, and it's not that hard to get customers to stay on the phone for a five-minute interview. And in a five-minute interview, you can do uh, 20 or 30 questions if, you, if you've structured it correctly. On the other hand, um, putting them into an automated system is much less, uh, much less likely to communicate that message. It's harder to get people to take the survey. And they're more likely to bail out. And what we've found is that three to five questions in an IVR survey seems to be about the limit for, for patients. Um, if you go beyond that, then the percentage of people who hang up starts to go up. And, uh, and you're just not going to get all that much data on those later questions. Um, online type surveys, I typically recommend that you keep it to one screen so that people can see this is how long it's going to be and, and no more. Um, and another thing to keep in mind is that all else being equal, a shorter survey is better than a longer survey. Right. And so if there's a question that you're not sure if you need, take it off. Um, or, you know, try, uh, try running with it a little while, and then if you're not using the data from that question, take it off. It's always right. yeah. better if that question's not there. Yeah, Peter, I uh, agree with all the points made, and I, I just had a couple of things. You have to sometimes resist the um, impulses of your marketing department or your corporate image department or wherever else there might be 
in terms of uh, having them want to include questions that really have nothing to do with the customer experience from your call center and uh, where they're saying, okay, well, people are calling in, so let's ask them <laughs> okay, about this or that. And, and uh, if that's what it's all about, then that's fine. But if you're mixing up, what was your customer experience like on that call you just made with, well, what do you think about co company XYZ? then usually that's kind of a toxic combination and, and things will sort of cross over and get get things mixed up uh, a bit. The, the, the other thing that I'd mention too is that it's important to really think about your demographic when you're uh, deciding how long you dare make your uh, survey. Because, uh, Peter, for instance, uh, we, we did work for um, eBay, and we can, we can talk about that because they told us we could uh, back in the day, and uh, for emails and things like that. And when you have a user community that feels very invested in the company that's asking the questions, they will have more tolerance than uh, people who are just casual consumers. And so you might be able to, to push them a little bit more than you can the normal person that you're surveying. Similarly, if you have a demographic that's uh, much older and basically uh, full of retirees, one of the companies perhaps that uh, is affiliated with AARP, uh, then you might be able to do a little bit more than if you're uh, with a demographic of 20, 30-somethings uh, because they're going to definitely not have the patience for something long. So <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, great question. And, and uh, Peter, uh, thank you for your input on that as well as for your input in general today. I think it's been a very interesting show. Uh, this is a big topic with a lot of important implications for our listeners so uh, I want to thank you very much and uh, thank our listeners and turn things back over to Brian. Yeah, you guys, I appreciate it very much. And uh, if we don't mind, I have one more good question I wanted to wrap up with because I think it's going to kind of encompass almost this whole conversation. If that's okay, Bruce, do you mind one more? Absolutely. I'm afraid I'm going to have to go offline, so can I leave you with uh, Peter? You bet. I'll do it. And uh, thanks for okay. joining us, Bruce. Enjoy the rest of your day in Baltimore. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you, Bruce. Okay. All right, Peter, it's you and me. But uh, before we jump into that last question, uh, now is a great time to go ahead and give away that 50% off coupon for our call center IVR assessment. So uh, in an effort to show you, our listeners, our appreciation for listening to all the great questions and suggestions that you brought to us, we want to give you this half-off IVR assessment. So it's real easy. If you're listening and you're by your computer, you've got the advantage because the fourth person to email me with IVR in the subject line will get that half-off IVR. IVR assessment. And my email is brian at benchmarkportal.com, spelled out B-R-I-A-N. So the fourth person, subject line IVR, is going to get that half-off coupon. So I want to remind uh, to our archive listeners, this is only for our live listeners, uh, but uh, if you're listening to this a month down the road and you don't see an email, I'll be happy to talk to you, but unfortunately I can't give you the 50% off discount. Okay, so good luck everyone on that. And uh, Peter, the final question came in uh, from our call talk. TV, and I thought it was a good one. It's uh, definitely potential for some take home here. And the question is Is there a best practice in the questions that need to be asked in the survey? So I'll let you take it away. Um, yes, and, and a lot of this really comes down to what is the purpose of the survey. You know, I, I mentioned early, earlier that there's a lot of companies that are doing surveys that maybe haven't really defined the purpose very carefully. So a typical purpose might be, for example, to uh, track the, the performance over time of some high-level metrics like call satisfaction or overall company satisfaction. Um, another purpose might be to try to uh, train individual agents or get feedback for, for making specific changes. Um, those are going to point to different general types of questions, but the first rule that we, that we want to use whenever possible is if there is another survey instrument in use at the company where you might want to compare the data, use exactly the same question. Um, so if you are asking, let's say, a company satisfaction question and there is a 1 to 10 scale on that, that is the question that you want to put on your, on your survey. Um, if there is a if if there is um, another time series out there that you want to make sure that you're consistent with, same thing. 
Next thing is we want to put the high-level questions at the beginning of the survey and more detailed questions later on. The reason for that is that you want to get kind of the unvarnished opinion of the customer for those high-level tracking questions um, before you've kind of reminded them or jogged their memory about other things that might have happened in the experience that might color how they're going to answer that. So those are the two main rules. And beyond that, I don't think there is, you know, there isn't a specific, um, there, there isn't a hard and fast rule about, let's say, using a five-point scale versus a seven-point or a ten-point scale, or is it better to ask a, general loyalty question versus, um, you know, let's say a net promoter question. In many cases, you're getting it at kind of the same thing. Many companies will actually ask the same thing in a couple of different ways. And the key is to be consistent and to put those general questions up front. Okay. Very good answer, and hopefully that helped. Uh, I don't have a name, but that was a guest from our calltalk.tv. So uh, thanks, Peter, for that insight. And I'll be honest, uh, you know, I've got a, a question or two more. If you have the time, do you uh, want to take one or two more questions? Absolutely. Let's go for it. Okay. I guess while the uh, the cat's away, the mice will play. So here we go. All right. Uh, this one comes from Bill. And uh, the, I, I see this also a lot in the social media side of things, is people, if there is an, uh, an issue with social media, it's how do you address and respond to either some negative comments or so forth. And uh, that's what this question seems to be leading towards. So uh, Bill writes, what's the best way to handle really upset customers? Right now, we don't do anything special when a customer gives us a really bad survey, but should we? You know, service recovery really should be baked into any customer feedback program. Um, you have to be, you know, you have to be a little bit cautious, especially when it comes to social media, because people who are complaining may not be representative of, uh, of kind of your overall customers. But if somebody is complaining, that customer has a problem, and there should be a process to follow up with that customer and understand, fix the problem as appropriate. Um, and also, you should be tracking those to understand what it is that are generating those kinds of complaints, what you're doing to follow up with them, and is there something at a process level or, or some other level in the organization that ought to be fixed in order to, uh, in order to prevent those kinds of issues from happening in the future. So absolutely, we, you, you, should, you should have a service recovery process. It is something that can be triggered in a variety of different ways, including through customer survey or social media complaints, uh, but it's also important to track it and to manage that process so that you can prevent issues in the future. Mm. It seems to me that it would be pretty important to, uh, if you had a negative contact, to be able to turn that around and possibly even make it a, uh, a more uh, long-term relationship with that client, maybe. Do you agree? Yeah, and, you know, the research has shown that if you can handle a customer's bad experience well, that's, uh, that's oftentimes going to get you more loyalty in the long run than uh, just not having the bad experience in the first place. Not that I'm recommending that you go out and intentionally mess things up, but that service recovery is a great opportunity to, to turn customers around and, and generate loyalty. Mm, I like that. I like that. Okay. Another one then uh, is, as you mentioned earlier, uh, about using surveys as training tools. Uh, do you have anything as a particular example towards that? Um, yeah, I kind of uh, touched on this earlier before, but the, the survey can be a very powerful training tool, especially when you can combine it with other and more traditional training tools. Um, Hearing the voice of the customer and the, the specific issues that a customer may have is it gets through a lot of the defensiveness and the negativity that you can oftentimes see when you try to coach someone or say, There's, we'd like you to do this in this way rather than that way. You know, it's, it, when, when it's your supervisor saying that, mentally it's easy to kind of put up the barriers and say, well, you know, I, I know how I'm handling this, and I don't think that's such a great idea. Uh, maybe I'll go along, but I'm not totally checked in. But when the customer says, I wanted this to happen, and it didn't happen, and I felt this way, that's much more powerful. So, so I recommend combining the, 
voice of the customer, the, the actual recording of an interview if it's available, with the recording of the phone call, other kinds of, of training tools, and really giving a 360 view to that individual. Uh, it's, it's very powerful, it's very efficient, and, uh, and it can help people understand what it is that they're doing from the perspective of the customer instead of just from the perspective of somebody else in the, in the call center. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, very good uh, answers to all those questions. And I guess we'll go ahead and kind of wrap things up right now. Uh, uh, Peter, any final thoughts from, from you and from Vocal Labs? You know, this is a – customer feedback is, is – uh, it's, it's, it's like Spider-Man superpowers. It's, uh, it's great power, but you need to use it with responsibility in the right way. It's very easy to put together a bad process. It's very easy to have something that maybe checks the box that says that you're collecting customer feedback, but it's not really moving the needle for you. But when you do it right and when you take care with making it actionable, credible, and, uh, and reliable, it can be one of the most powerful tools out there for understanding how to get the most out of your customer care operation. Very well said, Peter. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that. And Peter, really appreciate uh, you joining Bruce and I today and uh, look forward to uh, hearing more about best practices around uh, customer satisfaction and feedback here in the future. So thanks again, Peter. Thank you, Brian. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap things up then uh, for another session of Call Talk. And uh, and I want to remind you that you can sign up for a free reality check at Benchmark Report to see how well your call center compares to others in the industry. And I just want to also encourage everyone to get out there and take some of the things that you learned today from this Call Talk and wish you good luck with your design of your uh, customer satisfaction survey. So all that being said, I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Keep those headsets steady and your fingers ready. This is Brian Carrington signing out. Have a great day.